Thank you for listening to Conversations in Integrative Medicine sponsored by the Holt Institute of Medicine and Natural Clinician. Um, an in-depth uh, teaching exercise for individuals who are interested in, let's say, alternative or integrated medicine modules that may be practiced uh, by some physicians. So what I want to talk about is a continuity of talking about arthritis and joint health and focusing on existing allopathic treatments which often involve the use of pain-killing anti-inflammatory drugs. And let's start off by defining some of these drug categories and how they're used. First of all, we have painkillers such as acetaminophen or Tylenol or paracetamol, uh, all the same substance. Paracetamol or acetaminophen is a fairly effective analgesic but has relatively poor anti-inflammatory actions. So it's useful as a band-aid for a joint pain but certainly may not change the clinical history or course of arthritis itself. The second large group of drugs that are used and are among the most frequently used drugs of all are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And as the name suggests, they're not steroids, but we do see the inappropriate use of corticosteroids in the treatment of a lot of different types of arthritis, especially in animals, incidentally. But corticosteroids are best avoided uh, because of their adverse event profile, if at all possible, but may be very necessary in some circumstances, especially in autoimmune disease. But generally, uh, corticosteroids can't be seen to be uh, really a good solution to altering the clinical course of disease either. Um, <clears throat> non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs include aspirin and a whole host of other types of drugs such as popular drugs like ibuprofen, popular drugs like naproxen or naproxen, um, more traditional non-steroidals like indomethacin and phenylbutazone, these drugs are not very popular anymore except again in animals. Um, and then newer forms of cyclooxygenase inhibiting drugs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, namely Celebrex, Vioxx, and a whole host of new genericized COX-2 inhibitors. So we mentioned cyclooxygenase enzymes, and what these drugs do is they interfere with conversion pathways in uh, really the expression of COX-1, cyclooxygenase 1, and cyclooxygenase 2 enzymes. So certain non-steroidals like ibuprofen will inhibit COX-1 and COX-2 receptors, whereas um, selective or more selective COX-2 inhibitors are out there in the form of Vioxx and Celebrex. Now I mentioned public health concerns, but in essence you could see that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are probably the commonest reason for adverse event reporting to the US Food and Drug Administration. And the side effect profile of of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs is really uh, quite concerning. First and foremost, they not uncommonly cause dyspepsia, in fact quite frequently. Um, they may cause peptic ulceration, they certainly may cause uh, aggravation of acid peptic disease and the presence of peptic ulceration is a relative contraindication and perhaps even gastroesophageal reflux disease. Um, they certainly impair liver function, uh, they certainly impair renal function, uh, and sometimes they have to be stopped for diminution in renal function, especially in the elderly, or signs of liver inflammation with raised enzymes. So we know that these are characteristic side effects, but when we get back to the gastrointestinal tract, we can see studies, including those of my colleagues and I, where about 62% of all life-threatening bleeding from the upper or lower digestive tract is associated with the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or NSAID, as I've mentioned for short. 
So, in fact, if you look at community hospital intake, you look at veterans administration intake, and you look at university hospital intake, those people in the emergency room with significant upper or lower di digestive bleeding are taking NSAID. And in fact, studies show us that some elderly people are taking more than NSAID, more than one NSAID at once without knowing it. Many people have not received instructions on the side effects of these drugs. And of course, this is a big issue. In fact, follow up of some of the patients that came into hospital with gastrointestinal bleeding um, were found to go back onto NSAID drugs after they left hospital. Um, and uh, obviously, the idea of asking an elderly person to bring in their arthritis medication is a very good idea. And you'll see that often elderly people have more than one type of NSAID. Some have a prescription for an NSAID and have gone out and purchased an over-the-counter NSAID. And the side effects I'm talking about are just as serious in over-the-counter use as they are in prescription use <coughs> of non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Now, matters became more serious about five, six years ago when we started to realize that perhaps these NSAIDs were compounding cardiovascular risk, increasing heart attack risk, increasing stroke risk. And we saw this specifically in relationship to COX-2 inhibitors, most specifically Viox. But, you know, more recent data implies that even the less selective COX inhibitors, such as ibuprofen, may carry a risk of enhanced cardiovascular problems. So it may not just be about the COX-2 inhibitors, and of course there's further vigilance in this particular area. Now, in the integrated medicine model, we're thinking about the obvious, which is, you know, the precipitation of gastrointestinal bleeding. But let me explain that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are a very common cause of digestive upset. The non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug not only breaks the gastric mucosal barriers, it also has a major effect on intestinal linings and colonic linings. In fact, studies that showed um, imaging of the bowel showed that lower digestive tract injury was quite common in people taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and they lie at the heart of one of the causes of leaky gut syndrome or enhanced intestinal permeability. So talking about NSAIDs is almost to say, well, just a minute, these are pretty serious problems and no wonder people are seeking viable alternatives to drug therapy with the limitations of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs in terms of a side effect profile. So we're winning if we can use anything that limits the dosage of these drugs. And a very valuable, simple therapeutic maneuver is to reduce the dosage of NSAID by using topical pain rubs, especially containing natural substances like capsaicin or cooling agents like menthol or menthones or camphor. And we see these products that are produced that are quite valuable. In fact, some studies have shown reductions in dosage by a factor of up to two-thirds by the use of the temporary relief obtained with some of these bone and joint rubs. Now, one isn't supposed to compare natural products with drugs, but in essence, uh, we see a circumstance where dietary supplements have become a mainstay of practice, even in conventional medicine. A lot of orthopedic surgeons are now using products like glucosamine to assist in the nutritional management of uh, general arthritis, uh, most specifically osteoarthritis. So what I'm saying isn't alien to the conventional medical group, and it's really uh, an increasing practice given the onerous problems that we see with non-steroidals. So uh, one can see in the integrated medicine model any attempts to reduce these agents uh, are seen as meritorious uh, to reduce iatrogenic disease caused by non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which are really a modern public health concern. Thank you very much for listening.